we're here at the Frederick J. Brown The Sound of Color exhibition of Barry Campbell. Um, and here I have Jean-Claude Samuel, architect, designer, artist, all around cool cat. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us, Jean-Claude. It's, it's a great pleasure, really. Yeah. Um, so I think the first question I want to start with is when you see this work behind you, what, what is your first reaction and maybe what, what certain memories come up of like my father executing these types of works? Yeah, that's the memory. I just arrived to the States and met uh, Frederick and he was doing this work then. All the abstracts, some were dark, some were colorful, some, and it was a, an incredible world that he has created in Soho. And I walked in there and I was mesmerized because I've always wanted to paint, want to paint, and here's this guy that is really doing it, you know? And, and spectacular with the sizes, the mural sizes, so I really loved it. It was absolutely wonderful. And, and can you tell us a little bit about the loft space itself? Like what, what um, like sort of the estate? I mean, you were the one who ends up, you know, yeah. really designing the space. Right, so can right. you take us into the space a bit? It was a raw space. And you, we used to ride bicycles in there and all that. You know, I mean, 5,000 square feet of space, totally free. You know? There was no partition, no dividers yet. You only had a, section for the bathroom and another one for a little kitchenette and that was it the whole place was just there empty so we enjoyed it as such and it was great for parties dancing and all that you know we had band playing and people had room to move about and and be crazy so uh, then Frederick told me you know if, that he wanted me to design the space you know because it was just too voluminous he wanted area for your mom to create a dance and all that area for dining uh, you know dividing it as a as a place that should be so we sat down and came up with a theme and it worked out quite well we had uh, <coughs> bi-level spaces where we had upstairs because of, we had very high ceiling so we could do a, a sort of mezzanine in different places, like right above the kitchen was a mezzanine where there were a little studio, by, you know, for guests and stuff like that. So it became really a space. Did you ever see it? Mm -hmm. You did see it at the end, yes. right? So, and uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> pulling on edge on you. <laughs> um, so it that came out quite nice, you know. The, window treatment and all that. Mm -hmm. And we had a wonderful Japanese uh, carpenter mm -hmm. that we worked with. And yeah, we knew how to work with uh, precision, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it, the work turned out absolutely beautiful, you know, with sliding panels. And all the dividers were really free. There was no, no doors, really, except the, it was done in a way that you could go from one room to another and feel the privacy of each room without having to open a door, you know? So that was quite clever. I shouldn't say that because I was involved, <laughs> but uh, it, it turned out beautifully. Yeah. yeah, it seems to me, that, you know, from what you're saying, it was, in many ways, it was, it was in and of itself a blank canvas. Oh, absolutely. You know? yeah, absolutely, it was all white walls. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and when Frederick uh, was painting, he had, he had the space that was really his studio and that one was splattered all over, you know, as you can imagine. And still it was, it has a beauty of a gallery in itself. It was a studio and a gallery at the same time. So which was great because we could receive people in the living room, part of it, or even the bedroom. Everything was there, open. And he created, he even gave people an idea of what the art could look like in a, in a private environment because there was your bedroom and what was set, you know, what the size of painting and all that. It was sort of uh, premeditated that way, you know, and, and it worked. It worked very well. And in that way, it was, it was really, you know, kind of sort of flipping this relationship where it's like now this becomes the gallery space to, you know, yeah. receive patrons yeah. and yeah. what have you. And it's amazing to see the painting here. There's a great resemblance here with the loft. The loft was bigger. But it's the same configuration of white rooms, you know, that follow each other like that. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, when I came here first, wow, this is really reminiscing, you know? Right. And uh, so that's, uh, 
it's great to see them again, those paintings. I haven't seen them in years. I mean, I can't remember how many years, because I was at the, at the studio a lot with Frederick when he was painting. So I think I saw most of them being created, you know, late at night, you know, and drinking cognac and the rest, you know. <laughs> it, was, it was fun, a lot of fun, yeah. So can you say, can you say a little bit about the sort of multidisciplinary aspect of what almost, and we've talked about this before, what becomes a community really mm -hmm. at 120 mm -hmm. Wooster Street. Totally. Um, what were some of the advantages of that, of the space that allowed for maybe a multidisciplinary community to assemble? The place was very inviting because you have a lot of talent in Seoul, tremendous talent in any discipline you can think of from choreographers, sculptors, uh, Video, uh, a videographer, which was video, was just starting in that period, and you know Tony Ramos, Tony was doing all the video. We had people in many jazz, my God, all the greats of jazz that were in Seoul, and they were all friends of Frederick. So everybody would drop by and realize, oh, this place is cool, you know, because theirs was road, and nothing was done, you know, just throw together whatever they could, and that was it. That was a lot, you know. While Fairy Glove became a, like a structured place, you know, with a stage, so you could have performance with on the stage and all that. So everybody gravitated toward that, and so that's why it became that. And people brought dimensions to it, you know. When your mom was dancing and creating a ballet, for instance, in the in a space, that created an energy that was totally different than when another person, like like uh, Felipe reciting poetry. Right. That, and so you had different mood at different time. And it was unbelievable. Your dad was an impresario. He had that whole thing going. And he would like call in so and so, so and so came over and you meet so and so. And, and also clients, people who would later on purchase or even investors, they came and were mesmerized right. by that ambiance that was right. Uh, belly poke, you know, everything is happening, everybody's mm -hmm. doing something. Right. There was, if, so a lot of them were broke, but right. they were doing something, right, they were right. creating something, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was wonderful. You know? And so in, our, in, in my interview with Christine, mm -hmm. um, we were talking a lot about scale. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little something about maybe how, you know, scale was so important to my dad, whether it be the paintings, whether it be the space, and as we've talked about before, whether it be the projects, the many that there mm -hmm. were that obviously mm -hmm. seemed to envelop everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Frederick, had the, we had that in, uh, in a similar feeling about space and muralists and all the possibilities that one can, can, uh, can have. And uh, the space really reflected that because everything was large scale. The, there were no, no, no stamp size of anything, you know, everything was big. And I enjoyed that. That's what sort of attracted me to him also because in architecture, I, I thought my feeling was about creating large spaces, you know. And I, I came from a school of my teachers where I had that way of thinking and I adapted it also. It was mm -hmm. because it's, it's not something you're born with necessarily with. But when you're exposed to it, and you can, and you, if, and my love of minimalism, for instance, came from that, mm -hmm. from my teachers in the School of Architecture, and mm -hmm. is to create that incredible ambiance, and we have one vase or one incredible painting that is speaking volume, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so that was uh, that was totally the concept of the love, and he, and everybody felt it, and everybody. People, I think some people ended up buying paintings that could not fit in their space, but they were taken <laughs> right. by it, you know, right. even in that environment. And, and some people went into, I know somebody specifically, that went into enlarging their space just they could have works, you know, because they were like, hmm, this right. is interesting, you know, <laughs> to have a wall space like that and not, right. uh, you know, and not having the right painting for it, right. you know. So it's, uh, I think I'm, I missed something. Or oh, um, and then and then if you could say a little something about also like the scale of these like projects or ideas that my father. Was oh yeah, with. your dad was just he was a Versailles type of mentality, you know. Right. Everything had to be grand, and, and and he loved it because I I echoed it. 
Right. So it, our friendship was built really on that sort of things first, you know? Right. That I enjoyed the grandiose of, uh, of the, palace, the, the palace of Europe, or so even some in America, the Smithsonian and places that have scaled, you know? Mm-hmm. That's anthropometry, you know, creating something that is really gigantic to intimidate man or to, right. to attract him, like the cathedrals and all that. It's all based on that concept. It's so grandiose and so, such a large scale that people feel, oh my God, there is a God really, you know? <laughs> you know? Right. It, because it minimizes you. Right. And Frederick be, believes in that. He, he was a lover of the, of the cathedrals of Europe. You know, he, he, he went and visited all the most cities that he could. Right. And I, so did I. So right. it was like, wow, this guy right. is cool, you know? Right. <laughs> and so the, the anthropometry was tremendous about right. what, what he did, you know? Right. And uh, because it's even, and he liked fashion. And same thing in fashion. When you think of, for instance, when you look at some of these old uh, mansions and castles, the women in, in turn of the century wore these incredible crinoline dresses, you know, very large. And they needed room to float through. Right. So the architects had to follow that, mm. you know, and mm. create the, the space and the door, especially the door, the pompadour. Right. They needed space. The women were not going to bend their head. That's right. totally <laughs> anti-cool, you know? Right. So they had to find a way to flow. Right. And all that it yeah. was created in that. that taking that in consideration. Right. Yeah. I, and I, 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 it's just really enlightening to hear this idea that scale runs through every aspect Absolutely. of the Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So whether it be the space, um, whether it be the work, and right. from what you're saying also, whether it be the individual, yeah. too. Yeah. It seems oh, to it, be that it, all of this It really work. comes from the individual. Mm-hmm. That's why where anthropometry is, is taking the individual and creating things at different scale mm-hmm. accordingly, like I said to you, for instance, the grandeurs of a, of a castle or, right. or the cathedral versus a home. Right. The home still can be grand, but not as grand as those public spaces, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And a lot of these artists, you know, you see people like Michelangelo and all the great uh, painters, they work, they did the work in cathedrals and in uh, spaces where they, they were really grand, you know? When you go to the Vatican to see those works, it's like, wow, right. that is it, you know? Right. And uh, so anthropometry has always been there, right. and especially, the, the clergy and the Catholic Church, man, they had a great feeling about that, right. creating places to intimidate the right. masses, you know? And, and, you know, it reminds me also of, like, the spiritual components of sure. these works as well. Mm-hmm. There's something um, almost, like, sacred when you feel, when, when you're in the presence of these works. Mm-hmm. I think in large part because of this presence that you're talking about sure. that they create. Sure. Um, Maybe can you speak a bit about that, and have you, do you yeah. have conversations about it, that? It, yeah, we, used to, we spoke a lot about it, Frederick Marcel. It filters through. That's why when you look at one of these, especially these old work, these, you know, the, the ones we are surrounded by now, it, it, it was going through that projection of hope that I just uh, mm-hmm. talked to you about. And it, you feel it in the work. That's what makes the work so powerful when you're looking at it, mm-hmm. because it has that. It opens up your your, mm-hmm. your feelings. Mm-hmm. You know, when you look at it, it's not a limited, uh, right. a small work at all. They they, have, they project right. all the time, and that's what you feel when you look at throughout the the, the gallery. They're, they're they're large scale. They are right. big. Right. They're speaking volume. Right. You know? And what strikes me is even the smallest work yep. is able to Project. produce that same yeah, feeling. Yeah. Because um, it comes from the same artist. Right, 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 right. That's his work. Yeah. So he can, do, he can amplify it and mm-hmm. diminish whatever he mm-hmm. wants, but the grandeur is still there. Right, you right. Know? It doesn't and, matter. You know, and it, it goes back to something you know, my dad always used to tell me. He's like, you know, in a very simple way, the small work has mm-hmm. to register on the same level Absolutely. as the large work. Absolutely. You know, that's integral to the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess maybe my last question is, is there a work in particular that, you know, that, you know, brings you back or that's particularly striking to you or that you find to be oh your favorite? Oh my God, that's not a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love his work, you know that. I, I think I love it. Like people always say, I love my children the same. You know? <laughs> right, right. I cannot 
my children, they are my nephews. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love all of them the same, but there's a work though that for some reason, maybe I'm, my va own vanity, I'm part of it, that always in my mind, and, I, and also the concept of it was so fantastic, is the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. the, when he painted the Last Supper, and I, I was the first one to, to sit for it, you right. know? Yeah. So he had that huge canvas, and he, I didn't know what he was doing. He, he did not tell me what he was doing. He had me sitting there and sketched me at the very far left of the, the, of the canvas mm -hmm. and started painting it. And then we talked and then I left. And then a few days later I came back and I see a few more guys in it, you know? And they said, oh, what do you think? I said, I think it's nice, but I don't, I don't know where are you going? Finally he gave up and told me, I said, the last supper. I said, wow, that's a brilliant idea. So all these guys in modern clothing, you know, surrounding that table as a last supper. And each one had a reason to be, mm -hmm. you know? And it, Judas included, included you know? <laughs> right, so, right. And I knew all the people, right. you know? So it was, I think I have something about that painting, not because of its style necessarily, right. which I think is great, right. but there's the, the thought behind right. it, you right. know? All the thoughts mm -hmm. behind it, right. you know? And it was, it was really right. something special, very special. Yeah, you know? and I think, um, you know, that ultimately brings me to, like, that a part of the significance of my father's work are the individual, like, the, in the community that, I don't want to say that he created, but, like, that assembled around the same idea Absolutely. at the same time. He was, the, he was definitely the guy, you know? He, he was an impresario, he was the friend, he was, he was the dreamer, he was the one that, that really had the thoughts, you know? Right. And everybody followed. The musicians or whatever discipline people were in, followed his lead that way, right. even subliminally or directly, right. because he was a, a great dreamer. He had big dreams, you know? Right. And uh, so that's why you see that any, anybody that associated with themselves with him right. had to step up. Step up. Right. Uh, right. You know, otherwise, not. Nah, come right. on, you're boring. You know, right. you don't, right. you don't right. know what I'm talking about. Right. You know? right. <laughs> and he would, yes. he would say, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, right. yeah, no, that, that's definitely there. That's right. why you will find anyone, um, you've interviewed a lot of his friends, uh, you'll find that they think right. in that direction. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, okay. Alright. Well thank you so much, John Claude. Sure.